know we've kind of been long on some of this. Kind of got into some of this uh, last Wednesday night. Uh, we were talking with uh, Mark and Tanya, I think it was last night, and we were talking about animals and uh, our little dog about got hit. And of course it was my fault, even though Brooke was closer and Brooke was the one calling across the road, but it was my fault. Uh, and uh, But uh, we were talking about it, and uh, Mark was talking about how uh, when their daughter Shelby died, he cried like a baby. And I told him, you know, uh, I was instilled a long time ago an animal's an animal. Uh, I love my animals. As, as you all know, I love my little dog death. But when one of them passes, it does not affect me. And Brooke said, yeah, but you got to remember, Jeremy also didn't cry at his own dad's funeral. So, you know, I'm a little different with dad. Uh, but a lot of that, I, I truly believe the reason I'm so different with dad, and I told them this, one thing I do know is ever since my best friend Brian Wagner died, the hardest death I have encountered since Brian Wagner died was Hazel Swain's. That was the hardest on me. Even Miss Frona died. It was me, me and her talked. I knew Miss Hazel was unexpected and out of nowhere, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. It really did. It, it hurt me more than any. Uh, but when Brian Wagner died, God done something for me that I had ever, I had never felt in my life. And ever since then, it's not that I haven't felt it; it's that I haven't needed to feel it. He gave me such a peace. In the death of my best friend that I had never felt before in my life. And ever since then, death has not had the sting on me that it used to have. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see that here a little bit uh, tonight. The first thing we see here in, in verse 1 is it says, A good name is better than precious ornament, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. And I want you to understand what it's talking about here, a good name. It's not necessarily just talking about a good name in the world's eyes. Because our names might not be that good compared to the world's. Uh, but uh, what it's talking about is our reputation. A good reputation is better than, 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 than anything we could offer. And that's something we have to work on. It's not something that comes over time. Uh, one of the things, you know, people talk about respect, right? You want somebody to respect, respect you, you have to respect them. And it's a respect, it takes time. Same thing with trust. It takes time to build up the trust with somebody to be able to, 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 to trust each other. But a good name, a good reputation, it says, is better than precious ointment. And we, we, we understand a little bit about what precious ointment is. Remember when the, the, the lady came with the alabaster box and anointed Jesus' feet? That would be precious ointment. It was high value. Uh, was it uh, Judas that said, or Judas, or I can't remember if Judas or Simon said, I think it was Judas, but said, this could have been sold, right? She's wasting it on Jesus. This could have been sold and, and given to the poor. And, and But the, the precious ointment was, was something that they held dear to them. A lot of times they kept it for years before they ever even used it. And it was only used for a special occasion. And most of the time it was kept in a box that was sealed. And once you opened it, it had to be used. A lot of times it was used for burials. You put the precious ointment on the person you were burying to help them, you know, not smell as much and things like that. But he says here, a good reputation is better than this. A good reputation is more valuable than something that you would store up in your life. And we need to realize that as Christians, we need to have a good reputation. Now, I know some of us, uh, uh, like me, uh, there, there are some things in our past that damaged our reputation, hasn't it? Uh, some of us can be, our reputation can be damaged by our families. Uh, I've, all, I've, I've been fortunate. I've only had it happen one time. That somebody accused me of something or thought of me in a certain way because I was a Sanders. And because I was Robbie's. I had a parent come in one time that I was coaching and 
He was complaining about me and saying I was being mean to the kids and wrong to the kids and not being fair. And the principal asked him, said, what makes you think this? And he said, well, I knew his daddy. And, the, and Mr. Crawford said, I'll stop you right there. He's not his daddy. Totally different. And, but, I, you know, a good reputation means something, doesn't it? As Christians, what is a good reputation? It's our witness. It's our witness, isn't it? I, I, I don't... I try to please as... I, I'm, I'm real bad about that. To try to... And, and Brooke will tell you, I try to please other people. I want them to... I want them to think good about me. And a lot of times by doing that, I put my family on the back burner. Trying to, because what I don't want is I don't want... Here's what I don't want. I don't want people to not come to Mill Creek Baptist Church because of Jeremy Sanders. I don't want people to not need Jesus because of Jeremy Sanders. So we need to have a good reputation. It is more important for us to have that than anything that we can store up and keep in our lives. Then he goes on here and he says what? The, the day of death, a good name is better than precious, precious ornament, and the day of death than one, the day of one's birth. And you would say, Jeremy, this is ridiculous. When you read this with worldly eyes and worldly views, that sounds horrible, doesn't it? You're telling me that it's the, the day that I die is going to be better than the day that I was brought into this world. Well, according to the world, no. But according to those who are washed in the blood, according to those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life, the day that we die here on earth, the day that we, we give up this fleshly ghost, is the greatest day we'll ever have in our life. Because, I, and, and I know some people might disagree with me on this, but, but as I've read and I've studied in the Bible, I truly believe that, and I'm not just saying this, you know, a lot of people talk, use this scripture to be absent of the body as to be present with the Lord. I don't think Paul was just talking about death like that. I believe Paul was saying, when you can get out of this flesh, you're in the presence of Almighty. When you can put this flesh aside, you can get in the presence of Almighty. That's not where I think this comes, just where this comes from. But I truly believe that when we take our last breath down here, we take our first breath over there. I'm not one of these that there's a holding place. I'm sorry. And you say, why is that, Jeremy? Well, for one, when Jesus come up out of the grave, the Bible says they got up and walked the streets. The dead did. And where are all these other people? And who are those that were under the throne, the, the, the great, that come out of the great tribulation? What, where are all these people in heaven? I truly believe that when we die down here, we go there. So, yes, the day of death is better than the day of birth, isn't it? The day of birth, we're born into what? We're born into sorrow. We're born into pain. We're born into heartache. We're born into death, right? We're born into death. Man is born to do what? One thing that every man will do, every girl, every boy, every child that is born, one thing it will do is it will die. Some, will, some die before they ever get out of the womb. Some die not long after the womb. Some live a hundred years. But eventually they die. But the day that those that know Jesus die, they die to live forever. So it's better, isn't it? It's better for us. Let's look at verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of murder. What's he saying right here? He's saying in the times that you are burdened. In the times that you are sad. In the times that it hurts the most. That's when God strengthens you the most. That's when things... It, 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 I don't know about you all. It does. 
When we go to places where it's all fun, and, you know, and that, that's when, like last July when we had our cookout, our Fourth of July cookout. Well, we had, it, it rained and we still had a good time, didn't we? And that was not a house of mourning, was it? And now let's be honest, some people did grow that day. There were some young Christians that grew because of the fellowship, wasn't it? But at Hazel's death, we grew a lot closer as a church, didn't we? Do you realize the fourth, we weren't one mind, one body, one accord. There was disagreements. We should have had this food. We should have had that food. We should have had this and that. We should have had that. Hazel's dead. What were we? One mind. One body. One accord. We all had one thing. And through that pain that we all felt. And I truly believe that we all felt that. Hazel was special to all of us. You know why? Because all of us, at some point in time, what did we do for Hazel? We helped her, not realizing this, that it was helping us. It was making us stronger. Even when the washer fell on Jonathan's legs coming down them steps, and Margie was worried about the washer. I mean, she said, oh, no, he broke the washer. And that washer was laying on Jonathan's legs. And he said, if you don't get this off me, Jeremy, I'm going to kick it down that hill. I was rolling. It was hilarious. Even in that, I was made stronger. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Because the wise realize you get more. When do we learn our best lessons? When we fail or when we lose something. Right? You learn a lot more by failing and losing than you ever do by trying. And it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. And through that, our hearts are what? Our hearts are strengthened. Through the, the pain and the sorrow and the suffering, our hearts are made stronger, aren't they? I'll never forget when, when we had, uh, I think it was Brody. When we had Brody, Dr. Sturgill, uh, and I, I love Dr. Sturgill. Every time we, I, we go see Dr. Sturgill, we talk about God and things. He's, he's just really good. Uh, he prayed over my son after doing his circumcision. And from that day forward, I looked at Brooke and I said, that's, that's our doctor. That's his doctor. If he's willing to pray over my son, he can do anything else. But uh, Dr. Sturgeon told us one time, he said, now listen. He said, there's going to be times that you get tired. Caleb and Stephen, you, you need to listen to this. There's going to be times that you get tired because you've been up all night and the baby's crying. And, they're, and you're getting aggravated and you're getting upset. He said, when you get to that point... He said, take that baby in there and lay it in its crib and go outside and take a walk. And I said, huh? Brooke looks at me and goes, huh? He said, there has never been a child die from crying. Amen. Never. And you know what it actually does? What does it do? It builds their lungs. It clears things out. In that sad moment of their lives, what does it do? Strengthens them. Right? Everybody in here has lost someone that they've loved. And you thought what? I'm not going to get through this. I'm not going to make it through this. But what now? You look back now and what? You're stronger than you was when it happened, aren't you? You grew. You grow. Your heart seems to be a, a little bit bigger. You're able to take bigger and deeper breaths now. I'm not saying that the pain is gone. I'm not saying that you have forgotten. But well, through that sadness and through that, 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 that house of mourning, you strengthened yourself, haven't you?
Verse 5, he says, It is better to hear the, buke, the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of, of fools. Our world does not go by this, does it? Right? We would rather, our world would rather live our life, live lives off of an ACDC Beatles song, right? A Jimmy Buffett, it's five o'clock somewhere song, then do what? Hear Billy Graham and what he has to say. Wouldn't we? And, and, and we get like this now, don't we? We want to we we want to listen to what everybody else has got to say. I mean, I can even I can even go as far as say some in our church have got to the point where they don't want to hear what Jeremy has to say anymore, right? And I'm good, good. But if you're trying to listen to what Jeremy's saying, you're missing the whole point. It's not what Jeremy's saying; it's what God's saying. It's not my voice you need to be hearing; it's His. And if you listen to his voice, listen for his voice, you'll not hear me. I'm not saying that I'm wise. It's not me that's wise. It's God that's wise. And if we'll hear the rebuke of him, our lives will be better. But what do we do? Everybody here knows. You don't know no better, right? Somebody would look at me and say, he's just, he just young, he's a young preacher. I ain't going to listen to him. That's fine. It ain't hurt me. Do you realize that? I'm used to people not listening to me. I got two kids. Briley, don't do that. Briley, don't do that. Briley, don't do that. If I tell you again, Briley, I'm going to whoop you. Briley, I said, I'm used to people, they don't harm my I'm a school teacher. Don't listen. Don't, ain't nobody listens to me. And it's not hurting anybody but you. It's not going to hurt me. Do you realize that? It's not going to hurt me. And people say, oh, it must be nice. Listen. Yeah, it, it, it looks easy to be up here. It looks easy to stand and preach. It looks easy to teach. Until what? Until you have to do it. That's what I told them men when we were doing the Wednesday night Bible study. They said, oh, it's no big deal. You're behind that camera. Yeah. You're not behind the camera. I am. I hate it. It's the worst thing I ever did. And you say, oh, Jeremy, it's just because you, you, you want a crowd. It's just because you need a crowd. No, that wasn't it. I don't want, I don't want the, the camera. I don't want the video. The whole point of putting in that camera back there, and we, which we don't have it, we're still trying to The whole point of that was not for Jeremy to be on TV or to be on YouTube. The whole point was for people who cannot come to church to still be able to be a part of church. And as soon as we thought, you know what I thought of right off the bat when we decided to do this? Ada Smith. That's the first one hit my mind. Shelly could go over there and get Miss Ada set up. And Miss Ada could watch our, she could, Miss Ada hasn't been to church in what, five or six years, maybe longer. And she could do it. Better is, is to hear the rebuke of the wise than the, for a man to hear the songs of fools. Just look at verse 6. For as the cracking of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This is vanity. And it took me a moment to, to grasp this. Why did he use crackling of thorns under a pot? What, do, what will thorns not do? They will not put off steam, will they? They just burn up real fast. Don't they? Their point was to throw them in the fire, aren't they? Because they're going to burn up. They're going to crackle. It's like, you know, what does poplar do when you burn it? It crackles and it pops. And what happens? And it's gone in no time. And it's not very hot, is it? 
And he says, that's what the laughter of a fool, that's what listening to the songs of fools, he said, that's what it is in your life. You're, that's what you're doing. When you're listening to the world and you're not listening to what God has to say and the wisdom of God, he said, you're just like a bunch of thorns under a pot set on fire and you ain't worth nothing. You ain't producing no heat. And we get like this in our lives, don't we? I love the, one of the greatest experiences for our youth, our youth, is to be able to do some, some, a summer camp. I loved going to go tell camp when I was in, 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 in the youth group and then helping with youth group. But you can ask anybody, and, and, and Kathy can back me on this. The problem is when you come back from the youth camp, the fire does not last. It burns out. And that's what I'll never forget when, when the when the Go Tell Crusade come. That was that was that's what me and me and John talked about. And I was actually smart enough to just keep my mouth shut there in the meeting. But John stood up and that's what he said. He said, the biggest worry with this crusade is this. Will the fire stop? Because we did that every year. We'd come back from camp. We was on fire from God. We would lead the church service. And we would share our testimonies. And we would sing songs. And we would do skits. And for, for about two months. And then after about two months. We were like crackling thorns under a pot. We were, we were hot for just a moment. And then what happened? We got caught up in the laughter of fools. And in the songs of fools, what's that talking about? We got caught up in the world. Verse 7. Surely oppression maketh the wise man mad, and a gift destroy the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient of spirit is better than the proud of spirit. Be not hasty in the spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Surely oppression maketh the wise man mad, and a, a gift destroy the heart. Somebody who is oppressed long enough will break. I don't care how good they are. But if they are beat down and pushed down long enough, they will break. Even a, and that's what he's saying here. He said even a wise man will break under the oppression. How many of us know men and women in our church that we thought were, man, that, that, was, that is a man of God or that is a woman of God. I want to be like them. I want to serve God like they serve. And they get into a turmoil of life and they fall out. No matter how wise, and that's what he's saying here. You can be as wise as you want to, but if you're oppressed enough, you'll go mad. You'll lose it. You'll lose the faith. And he says, a gift destroyeth the heart. When I read that, this is one of the things, I, I, this is why I tell you all, it's such awkward for me when somebody comes out after church service and says, boy, that was a good message, preacher. Now, the ones that have been asleep and come out and say, boy, that was a good message, preacher, those aren't awkward. Those are funny. You know, because I'm thinking, you didn't hear a thing. <laughs> Great message. That's why, that's why it was so good. You got a good nap then. But people that, that, I, that I know that maybe listen, because why? I don't want... I don't want the, the, the gift. That's why when we do pastor appreciation, I don't want the gift. Why? Because it builds up pride. It makes me think that I've done something. It makes me think that I'm a good preacher. That I'm a good pastor. And I'm not. It destroys what's inside of me. It puts fleshly things inside of me. And that's what he's saying here. He says, people that are oppressed, even a wise man, I don't care how long, how long, how wise they are, if they're oppressed long enough, they will go mad. And somebody that, 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 that receives a gift, it can destroy their heart. It 
can. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And he says once again, and patient in spirit is better than proud in spirit. What's the, what is, he, talk, he says in Proverbs, pride comes before a fall. This is why I truly believe it's harder for men to accept Jesus than it is for women. Why? Men are more prideful. Except for in my relationship. Brooke's more prideful than me. You know how somebody's got a lot of pride? You know what they don't want to do? They don't want to say what? I'm sorry. The Lord's talking to you, honey. You'd be listening. That's kind of they don't want to say, I'm just acting right here. They don't want to say, I'm sorry, do they? It's never their fault, is it? Right? It's always somebody else's fault. I didn't do it. You messed up. I'm perfect. You're not. Right? But to be patient in spirit. Look at that word. And the patient in spirit. The what, What's that talking about? The humble in spirit. The lowly in spirit. The meek in spirit. The great example of this is when Jesus came on the very, on the woman caught in the very act of adultery, what did he do? He was patient, wasn't he? He dropped down to his knees. He took his time, didn't he? He was humble about it. And when everybody got done, when all the proud in spirit got done casting their stones and railing out what, what she had done wrong, what did he do? He quietly and simply spoke up and said what? He, without sin, cast the first stone. I don't believe he yelled it. I don't believe he was angry about it. He just said, he, without sin, cast the first stone. Patient. In spirit. That's what we're to be, aren't we? You would think after what we went through, listen, and, and, and Lord's still trying to teach us. How long have we been trying to get this camera stuff, internet hooked up, John? Three weeks? Too long. Huh? Too long. Two, at least two, right? At least two weeks. Guess what? It's not been done. And I, I have. There's been times that I won't be like, are you kidding me? Why can't we get this? And then I realize. Five years ago, I would have freaked out over this. I would have been tore up. we got to get this in. But what I realize is it's all in God's time. It's, just be patient. He's still trying to teach this church patience, even though we had to be patient to get in this building. But what happens? Just like, just like this. This building is no longer new to us anymore, is it? The newness is already wore off. And the patience that we learn from getting into this building, it has done what? It is wearing off. Is it? Almost finished. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former, this is verse 10, that the former days were better than these. For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. We talked about this last Wednesday. How many of us have said our, our younger days were our better days? How many of us has told people that in high school, this is the best days of your life. Enjoy them. Because what are we saying? We're saying what? That was our best days. And he says, say not that the former days are better. Why? Because it goes back to what he's saying. We have better days ahead of us. For those that, that, that are joined to the all living, as Solomon said, we have a better life in front of us. 
Do you realize that? What Paul said, he said, the things that we have went through will not compare to the reward that we will receive when we get there with them. It won't compare. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense, but the excell excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. He says, oh, wisdom is good. It's a, it's a good defense to have in life. And, and money, money is a good defense. Oh, you can keep off a lot of things with money. He says, but oh, the excellency, the, he said, what really matters, the, the true thing of, of, of knowledge is this. Wisdom does what? It gives you life. Money does not give you life, does it? And what wisdom is he talking about here? He's not talking about earthly wisdom. He's talking about heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom gives us life. And remember, life is more than what? Raiment and food. It's more than that. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. He says, when you, when you have a good day, when, when things are going good, he says, be joyful. Enjoy it. Take good in it. But in the day of adversity, what did he say? Consider. Consider. Consider what? Consider that you were joyful in the day of prosperity. Consider the good things of what? When you have adversity, consider it. Because what? God has also set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. And when I read that, I could not grasp that. I could not figure that out until I read that last little part of the bit. To the end that man should not find nothing after him. What it's saying is rejoice in the good times and in the bad times. Consider this. God has made it like this. That what? Even that no matter what, no matter what in life, even in the bad times, after we search everything out, the only thing that we find in all things is what? Him. And we see Solomon begin to change a little bit, don't we? To the end that man should find nothing after him. Man should find nothing after God. God's it. When you found God, you found the end. That's the end. But it's an end that does not end. And that's what he's saying here. Be glad. When you're, when you're doing good, be glad when life's good. But in the day of adversity, think on this. You can't find nothing past God. In other words, He's the only one with the answer. He's the only way you're going to figure it out. He's the only way you're going to make it out. And that's what Solomon says. All right, anybody got anything like to add or 